Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? It's great to see all of you here. Welcome to Foundations Church. Um, we're delighted that you're with us. Really, really happy that you're here. Uh, we're in a series, as Dan mentioned, Upside Down Living, when things don't appear as sometimes we think they appear. And so we're really, really glad you're here. Delight, if it's your first time, again, we're uh, very just thrilled that you could join us this morning. So, um, yeah, a lot going on this morning. We're going to talk about a, a great, great passage in scripture that's just been very meaningful so before we get into that um just next week uh vicky and i are going away we're going to like a, a, a relationship kind of seminar we're gonna get we're gonna get we're gonna get straightened out <laughs> so we're looking forward to that so next week carrie snyder our new youth pastor we just had from indiana just got calls from indiana he's been, just been a delight to be on staff he's going to be joining us next week as he's going to continue on with the series so that's just really good so invite you all back next week for that this morning we're going to talk about uh how how important it is to save the scraps in life turn to your partner and say save the scraps so let's, let's talk about that this morning. There, inside your program, there's a, uh, there's a little insert here about, uh, about the message. It's from Mark 6, chapter, Mark, we're going to read from Mark chapter 6, verses 42 to 52 this morning. So just in deference to the word of God this morning, let's just all stand together. Okay, let's all stand. And we're going to read this passage out loud together. If the font is too small on this, we'll put it up on the screens here so everybody can see it. And then we could all read this very enlightening passage for us today where God is talking about the importance of saving the scraps. We'll put it on the screen. Let's all read together out loud. Here we go. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed from those loaves. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when he saw, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. This is a miracle. We're going to talk this morning about how, how important it is to really understand that miracles uh, the importance of miracles is what we take from them, not what we leave behind. That our best days are not our yesterdays, but our best days are in front of us. And God wants us to learn from how he works in our life to remember that so that we can face the challenges of the future with confidence. So we're going to talk about that today. Before we do, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. In this heightened political season, we thank you that you are the king above all kings. No one elected you. No one put you in office. No one can impeach you. No one can fire you. You are the almighty God. And above you, there is no other. And for that, we give you thanks. Today, we gather to say we love you. We worship you. We extol you. We adore you. You're the majestic God. Today, where there's brokenness, we pray that you'll bring healing. Where there's discouragement, we pray that you'll bring comfort. Where our resolve is being weakened, we pray that you'll bring power. Father, where hope has been lost, we pray that you'll restore our hope. Father, in you, we have everything we need. So today in this room, in our hearts, May you speak, 
May you heal. May you minister. All for your glory and honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now before you get seated, shake three people's hands and tell them, save the scraps. Tell them, save the scraps. You better save the scraps, I'm telling you. You better save the scraps. I, I heard this, did you hear a story about this atheist who went hiking in, uh, in, in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park and he was just, it's a beautiful day and uh, he was just uh, adoring the power of evolution. He was looking at the trees and saying, wow, billions of years, look at the power of what evolution has brought. The trees, the mountains, the streams, the animals, wow. Evolution is amazing. As he's hiking, he heard a rush, he heard a rumbling behind him. He looked and it was a bear. He goes, oh no. And so he started running. He could not run a bear and the bear tackled him. And the bear had him down, pinned him down, had his right paw up there ready to come down on him. And just then the guy says, oh God, help me. And time stopped right there. The bear was just frozen and God says, what? You've been an atheist all your life and now you expect me to come at this moment and help you? You've shunned me, you've turned your back on me, you told my friends that I, you told your friends that, you, that I was a joke and now in this time of despair you call on God? The atheist says, well yeah, I know that sounds a little hypocritical so I guess that's a little ostentatious to do that. So at least, God, can you at least turn the bear into a Christian and God said okay and then time unfroze and the bear took his right hand and joined it to his left hand and says father I thank you for this great meal I'm about to have <laughs> today we're going to talk about a great meal it's a great meal and the important thing about this meal is certainly the power in the meal but the, certain, but the power in this meal is to save the, save the scrap. I, 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 sometimes for Christmas, sometimes for Christmas, if we have guests over, I make this Christmas quiche. Don't I, Vic? It, it's good. Oh, is it good? And I won't tell you the recipe because I'll have to kill you if I do. But I put, in, I put in like red peppers and green peppers to make it red and green Christmas and bacon and cheese. It's just really great. And we always make extra because then when the company comes that morning, we cook the quiche and it's really, really great. But we always make extra because what you do is what they don't eat, you save it. Because the next day, when all the cheese and all the peppers and all those flavors get, it's, it's better the second day than it is the first day because all the ingredients got to mingle together. So when they're done with their meal, they say, what should I do with the scraps? I tell them, save the scraps, doggone it. That's the best part, because tomorrow, that's going to be really good. Turn to your partner and tell them to save the scraps. You got to save the scraps. That's what you do. We're going to talk. I'm just going to talk. I'm just going to tell a story today. You guys could just sit back, and, and I'm going to tell a story, and you guys will listen. If you're okay with that, say, I'm okay. Yeah, so here's how it goes. There's two miracles. There's two miracles, and in between the miracles is the power of the story. The first is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible says 5,000 men, because back in that male-dominated society, they didn't count women and children. Jesus was just beginning his ministry, and his ministry is starting to build momentum, and all of a sudden, he got, he's gathered a crowd there, and all of a sudden, there's a crowd, and he begins to speak. He begins to speak with such power. Such magnitude. He was just bamboozling the crowd so much that they lost track of time. Have you ever been wrapped up in a hobby or doing something and before you know it, like the whole day has gone by and you hadn't eaten or anything like that? Have you ever had one of those days? And this was one of those days. He was speaking with such power, such magnitude that the people started feeling a little tired, a little, I mean, a little, a little hungry. But when they had to choose between getting food or being taught the word of God, they chose the word of God. This is, this is so powerful. We never heard anything like this. The Bible even says that man shouldn't live on bread alone but on every word that proceeds from the power of, from the hand from the word of God and so he, Jesus is teaching these people are just wrapped up and they're just caught up and before you know it the day is late and the sun is starting to go down and they haven't eaten anything all day I have to just pause and say this he attracted a crowd of 5,000 men the Bible says 5,000 men because back in that male dominated society they didn't count women and children 
And so 5,000 men are gathered. When 5,000 men are gathered, how many women are there? You're talking at least 5,000. And I don't know how this works, but whenever you get men and women together, somehow children start appearing. And so there's at least, as scholars say, there's at least 15,000 people. Why the Bible says there's 5,000 men because they didn't count women and children back then. But, but when you count women and children, there's probably about 15,000 people there. I have to tell you, in the last 100 years of our society, our, our, the population of our country has grown, of, of, of the world. In the last 100 years, the population of the world has grown from 4 billion to 7 billion people in the last 100 years. Back in Jesus' day, particularly in that geographical area where there wasn't a lot of population, to amass a crowd of 15,000 people to speak is quite a feat. He didn't have a business card. He didn't have a website. He wasn't tweeting or streaming or have a radio or TV ministry. He, he didn't even have a microphone. 15,000 people are gathered. It's late in the day. They're getting hungry. They're getting faint. And his disciples come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, we got a problem. He goes, what's the problem? They say, you know, you're kind of long-winded today. <laughs> people in Foundations Church have no idea what that means here, okay? All right? They go, you're kind of long-winded today. You know, here's the deal. You know what? We, we, need, we, we need to send the people home. Send them home and get them something to eat. And Jesus said this. He says this. They have no need to depart. They have no need to depart. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of them. And he asked them this question. What do you have? He asked, the mirror, he, he, asked, he asked the disciples, what do you have? It's like, we ain't got it. Here's what I want you to know. Miracles always start by what we have. You with me this morning? They always start by what we have. He goes, what do you have? We, we, we don't have anything. Well, find out what we have. So they take an inventory, they go throughout the whole crowd, and they found out nobody brought anything. They just thought they were going to listen to a teaching. Little did they know they'd be there all day. They did find a boy, however, who had a Happy Meal. He had five loaves and two fish. Isn't it interesting that God often... It's a little kid. It's a little kid that had it. Isn't it interesting that the people God uses are often the people that aren't counted. You with me on that one? God has chosen the weak to despise the broken things of this world, the things the world discards. Pfft, this kid wasn't even counted. He wasn't significant enough. But God often uses what people don't count, and that's what God counts on. He finds this little boy. They say, here's what we have. Miracles always start by what we have, not by lamenting what we don't have. So Jesus says, okay, all right, here, we got this, okay? Then what, he tells the, then what he tells the disciples to do, this is interesting, he says, break the crowd into groups of 50. Get them into groups of 50. Wow, you have a crowd of 15,000 people. Now they're counting everybody. To get them in groups of 50 takes some time, does it not? Take some time to gather a crowd that way. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's having the disciples organize the crowd that's going to take some time. Even though they're hungry right now, he just doesn't give them food right now. He has them get organized so that he can dispense the miracle. Often we want a miracle right now. Come on, I need it right now. Often God wants us to get our life together and organized and have some structure so the structure can withhold the massive blessing that God wants to give. You with me on this one? He wants us to organize. So he tells them, get, get organized. Get organized. So they organized in groups of 50. It took time. The people say, I'm hungry right now. Get in groups of 50. Okay, he gets in 50. Now the Bible is very clear, very clear on the inventory that they have. How many loaves do they have? How many fish? The Bible is unequivocally clear on that. There's no ambiguity. The inventory is very, very clear. Five loaves two fish. They give it to Jesus. Jesus takes the five loaves and two fish and he blesses it. Whoo! That's good. That's good. That's a good thing. Because here's what Jesus is doing. Before he can bless it and have it be enough for the multitude, he starts out by blessing what's not enough. You catching this this morning? 
He's saying, God, thank you for this. Before we can ask God for what we really need, sometimes what we need to do is cultivate gratitude for what we do have. God, my house isn't enough, but thank you for the house I have. God, my marriage isn't what I expected it to be, but I thank you for what I do have. God, my paycheck isn't stretched enough. It's not stretched enough, but I'm not going to be- I'm not going to bemoan what I don't have. I'm going to thank you for what I do have. Dear God, boy, this th- th- this child really has not lived up to my expectations. But I'm going to thank you for the gift that that child is to me and not bemoan what he isn't to me. Y'all with me this morning? Before we can expect God to bless us with more than enough, we have to be grateful for what we, what we perceive isn't enough. The inventory is very clear. How many loaves? How many fish? Very clear. Very clear. The inventory goes from what's very clear to become very, very ambiguous. We lose count. We lose count of the inventory because all of a sudden, when Jesus takes the loaves and the fish and he blesses them, then he starts to break them. And the minute he starts to break them, the minute he starts to break it, then we lose count of the inventory. The blessing, the multitude, the blessing of this five loaves and two fish are in the breaking. When he breaks it, then it becomes a blessing. If it's not broken, then it doesn't become a blessing, which reminds me this morning that if it's not broken, it can't be blessed. This morning, our blessing is proportionate to our willingness to be broken. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you broken? Because if you're not willing to be broken, then you're not willing to be blessed. And from my experience in life, the most powerful, the most blessed people in the world are the people who have been broken the most. Because in the broken, in the breaking lies the blessing. And as Jesus continues to break, the multitude continues to get blessed. And so I just want to stop the service this morning. By the way, so far it's a pretty good service, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I just am so insecure. Uh, okay, so I just want to stop the service this morning. And I want to thank God for all the times I've been broken in life. Because I thought at the time he was twisting me and torturing me and, 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 and rejecting me and forgot about me. But today it's appropriate just to take a little time this morning and say, thank you, God, for breaking me. Thank you for my broken heart. Thank you for my broken home. Thank you for my broken hopes. Thank you for my broken dreams. Thank you for that relationship being broken. Because during the time it was painful and it was hard and it was very, very discouraging and depressing. But as I look back, when you were breaking me, you were blessing me. The power is in the breaking. And so the, 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 the key is, is our willingness to be broken. And when, when, if we're willing to be broken, there lies the blessing that God has for us. Now, the disciples, Jesus is breaking it. Jesus is breaking it, and he gives it to the disciples, and they go around, and they disperse it to all the crowd. They disperse the whole thing to the whole crowd. And so I, I look better in the lights, don't I? So um, he disperses it to the crowd. Now, now, here's what I found out as I'm reading through this story. Here's what I'm finding out. That God often, God often brings his blessing through people. Even if it's people sometimes we don't like. <laughs> we're, we're, we're starting an initiative here in church about life groups and getting people in the life groups. <laughs> and I've had a few people, I appreciate, I, I appreciate them, you know, their candor, because I've had people say, ah, ah, man, it sounds painful to get in a room full of people and sit there and talk about stuff and everybody looking at their navel. Ugh, 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 ugh. I could find better things to do at home, like watching the amazing race or something, and sit in a room with people, and like some of them are really like crazy. It's like, I get it, I get it. I'm one of those crazy ones in the group, okay? But here's what I have found out. 
that God often brings his blessing through people. Can you imagine that crowd? They're all there listening to Jesus, and all of a sudden they're hungry, and Jesus says, I'll take care of you. Can you imagine his disciples are going around, here's a person in the crowd, "Uh uh-uh, no. I don't want your stinking bread and fish. I take it only from Jesus. It's all who I want it from. Peter, you stink like a fisherman. Uh Uh-uh. I don't want it. If that dude would have rejected Peter's fish and loaves, he would have never gotten fed that day. A lot of times God works through people. Often he works through people. Sometimes difficult people. And as they're going around, they're feeding the people. Now here's the deal. Here's the deal. All of a sudden, they're feeding the crowd. Now here's what I've noticed about my mom. Here's what I noticed about my mom. My mom's no longer with us, but my mom was really a good cook. She was really good. And we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up, but my mom didn't let that deter how many people we should feed. If my mom said, if you find someone hungry, bring them home. If you want a friend, home. But my mom always was adamant to whenever we brought somebody home that we should let her know ahead of time. Because here's what my mom does. I think all good chefs do this. They prepare food in proportion to the people that they're going to feed. Right? So my mom wouldn't know. She goes, I don't care if you bring someone home. You just let me know ahead of time. You just let me know ahead of time so I can make more fried bologna and stuff like that, okay? Because that's good, by the way. People don't eat that anymore, but that's how I live for a kid, okay? So she goes, let me know. I don't care. And so a good chef always prepares the food in proportion to the people that they're feeding. Now, God is feeding his people, and wow, is he way off? He missed it by a mile, because it says when they fed all the people, he just didn't prepare enough. It said he prepared more than enough. Which, by the way, we should hit the pause button here and say that's the way God always blesses people. God doesn't bless people just enough. He blesses them more than enough. That's why David says, my cup runneth over, God is so good. That's why the very name in the Bible, in the Old Testament of God, El Shaddai, means the God who blesses more than enough. God just doesn't want you to have enough. He wants you to have more than enough. Does that make sense? He doesn't want us just to squeak by. The Bible says to me, he wants to bless me so much that the, my blessing, my cup runneth over. He just doesn't want to bless Carl. He wants to bless me so much that it blesses over and spills over, the Bible says, into my kid's life. And it spills over from their life into my grandkid's life. That's how much God wants to bless. That's El Shaddai, the God who blesses more than enough. Are you with me on this church? Yeah, we, we need to hear this today. We need to hear that God, this is want to bless you so I can squeak by. Oh boy, he wants to bless you more than enough. And so when the whole event is over, he blessed more than enough. There's food all over the place. And so he goes to his 12 disciples and says, there's a bunch of scraps all over the place. I want you to pick them up. How many disciples are there? 12. So they each get a basket And they're going around picking up (laughs) all the scraps. They're picking up all the scraps. And the Bible says that they ended up with 12 baskets full of scraps, one for each disciple. Now, here's my dilemma. Did God miscalculate, do you think? That's the question. I don't think so. I don't think so. He, He doesn't miscalculate. He didn't say, oh, shoot overcooked today oh messed up there no he knew exactly what he was doing now here's my dilemma the, the disciples go around with their baskets and they're picking up the 12 the fit they're picking up they're picking up the scraps of the, of the loaves and the fish and and they have 12 baskets full now the bible calls them fragments scraps they're not very appetizing you know what i'm saying these are like fish bones people left these are like the crust of the bread. No one eats the crust. No one eats it. This is just stuff no one eats. Now here's my dilemma. Why does God have them collect the scraps? Certainly not for in the future when they're hungry, right? You're not going to eat that stuff. That's nasty. And second of all, it would undermine what God just did. He's not going to say, hey, carry this pile of scraps so when you get hungry, eat this. By the way, I just fed 5,000, 15,000 people miraculously doesn't make sense so it's like okay so they're holding on to the scraps so after this miracle of feeding the 15,000 people which by the way up to this point is probably the most important day in the life of Jesus he started his life ministry at the age of 30 
And now it's just beginning. It's like the first year into it. And he's been doing miracles. But his miracles have been done in groups of twosies and threesies. Now he's just done a miracle <clears throat> and fed 15,000 people. Woo, baby. Now it's going to hit the fan. It's going to hit the fan now. Now there's no way of hiding who he is, that he's the son of God. 15 people, 15,000 people just saw this amazing miracle that God took nothing and multiplied it and fed everybody. These 15,000 people are going to hit the streets of Israel saying, we just met the Son of God, and we have testimony of that in my belly. In my belly. Okay? We have testimony of it. Wow, that's an important day. News is going to spread rapidly. News is going to spread rapidly. Now, the blessing of the Son of God is going to be a burden. Every blessing has a burden to it. Every blessing. Would you agree with that? I know everybody says, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. It's good. It's good to be blessed. I want to be blessed too. <laughs> but with every blessing comes the burden of that blessing. And it's heavy sometimes. Heavy. If you have the blessing of, 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 of a good spouse, it's a blessing. Sometimes it could be a burden. You could have the blessing of money. It's a great thing, but it could be a burden. You could have the It's all kinds of things. And so blessings often, we have to understand, come with a burden. So Jesus, sensing the burden that 15,000 people are now going to expose his identity, he tells the disciples, take those buckets, take those baskets of scraps, and I want you to get into the boat, and I want you to go across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. I'll join you. I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to pray. So you guys go. It's late. The sun is setting. Jesus goes up to the mountain side by the side of the lake to pray. And I think he's praying. We don't know for sure. But I think he's praying to the Father. Father, you've told me that my mission in life is to be about your business. Now I'm about your business. And oh boy, the world set aflame. And now the burden of being the Son of God is going to come upon me. And I need your help. And I need your strength to be able to carry this burden. And all of a sudden he's praying. And he's praying. And he's praying intensely. Because the hours are going. The sun has now set. The temperature has now dropped. The winds have picked up, and now it's nighttime. In fact, the Bible says it's 3 o'clock in the morning. It's 3 a.m. The wind has picked up so much. The waves on the Sea of Galilee are starting to rock and roll, and all of a sudden the disciples are in the boat with the scraps, and all of a sudden they're halfway through they're halfway through the, the lake, and they can't go any farther. They're pushing. They're rowing as hard as they can, and their boat's not going anywhere. It's no match for the winds and the waves, and they're stuck. And it says this, why Jesus was on the mountain, and they're pushing, and they can't get anywhere. Why Jesus was on the mountain, he was aware of their dilemma. Now, here's the problem. It's dark. It's dangerous. And here's the disciples, and there's distance, darkness, and danger, and distance between the disciples and Jesus. Jesus knows their problems. It says he knows that they're stuck. He knows, but there's darkness and distance and danger between him and them. The only way the disciples are going to have any kind of uh, opportunity for rescue is if these two problems get reconciled. Y'all with me today? So Jesus leaves the mountain at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he starts walking across the lake on top of the water. The very things that we're scared of and we think are going to take us under are the very things that Jesus is walking on top of. No problem for him. No problem for him. And he's walking. And all of a sudden, in the storm, he looks like a ghost. <laughs> he looks like a ghost. By the way, we dare not be too critical of the disciples here. Let me just take a little parenthesis here. Because in a chapter or two before this, the disciples were with Jesus when he went out to the wilderness and met this crazy man out in the wilderness. I call him the Incredible Hulk. He was this man who no one, he was just so powerful, it said. He lived out in the tombs by himself that no chain could tie They tried to chain this guy. He was so strong, he just broke the chains. He lived out there by himself. And when Jesus went out there, the guy says, what do you have to do with me? And Jesus says, I'm interested in your life. And found out the guy was covered, was filled with demons. And Jesus says, what's your name? And he says, Legion. And the demon says, we can't deal with Jesus. He's too powerful. So the demon says, let us go into the pigs that are, that are out there. And so they went to the pigs. 
And then the pigs, when they were uh, infested with these demons, the pigs ran off a cliff and went into the Sea of Galilee, the same sea they're in. Are oh, you all with me this morning? Okay? So now they know that's the same sea. They saw that. It's like, whoo, that, 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 that sea's infested with demons? So when they see this thing walking across the water at 3 o'clock in the morning, they go, oh, no, we're freaking out. Now, when you read the passage, did you read what was happening? Jesus knew the disciples were in the water and struggling. But did you read the passage? It says Jesus wasn't coming to them. Did you read that? He was going by them. You all with me? If you are, say, I am. He's walking by them. He's walking by them. And all of a sudden, they say, it's a ghost. Oh, no. They don't recognize Jesus. They don't see him for who he is. They don't, know, they don't recognize his stature. They don't recognize his gait. They recognize nothing about him. They're freaked out. Oh, no. This is a ghost. Jesus says this. Don't be afraid. It's me. The minute they heard his voice, then they recognized that was Jesus. The Bible says, my sheep shall know my voice. They didn't recognize him, but the minute they heard him, they go, that's him. That's him. And then they said, come here, come here. And Jesus goes into the boat. That's good, because here's what I want you to know today. That Jesus, he saw the disciples. They were struggling. He was going by them. He didn't get engaged in their dilemma until he was invited into their dilemma. You with me this morning? He was just going by. It wasn't until the disciples said, hey, we need you, come here. It wasn't until he was invited into their mess that he got into their mess, which is important to know because Jesus knows about our messes, but he's not going to get into our mess until he's invited into our mess. We have to be engaged with Jesus for him to get involved in our mess. Just like the blind guy at Bartimaeus, the blind guy, saying he heard Jesus in town and he said, hey, Jesus, hey, I'm blind. And the minute he cried out to Jesus, Jesus came and healed him. The ten lepers, outcasts, ostracized in their society. It wasn't until they came to Jesus and said, hey, we, we need you to touch us, that they became healed. The woman who had an issue of blood, the Bible says for 38 years, tried everything to get well. The Bible says she spent all of her money on doctors, Nobody could make her better. It wasn't until she crawled through the streets of Jerusalem and touched the hem, reached out, I just want to touch his hem. It wasn't until she made that effort that Jesus says, woman, your faith has healed you. So we, have, we, we may have dilemmas today. We may be stuck and our boat may be rocking and we may be trying everything we can to get that boat moving. Jesus sees it. He's there. He's, he's, he's right there. He knows it. He's close by but he won't get engaged in our business until we invite him to get into our business today. It takes two. It's an engagement. So Jesus, is, he, he breaks into their calamity, and, and all of a sudden, and all of a sudden, here's what happens. Here's what happens. He gets into their boat, and the winds immediately stop. <laughs> the Bible says that as soon as he got into the boat, the winds stopped. <laughs> Boom! Wow, you know what that means? That wasn't a storm at all. That wasn't a storm. That was a fabricated experience that Jesus himself created. The minute he got in the boat, the storm stopped. God, Jesus, fabricated that experience to see his disciples go through that so that he could teach them something new about himself. Sometimes God sets up stuff, tests, the Bibles call them, tests that we're going through that he creates so that we can, he can show us new and different and deeper ways about God and reveal to us our heart at the same time. So he gets in the boat and immediately the wind stops. Stops. Now, I don't know if you guys, I'm old, I'm old. So uh, I don't know if you guys did this when you were a kid or they do it now, but when I was a kid, They used to have in school these things called open book tests. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, some of you, I have no idea, you're too old, okay? But back in in, in dinosaur ages, they used to have tests, and they would give us the test, and we'd have the book, and we were allowed to use our book to find the answers. It was a way to learn research and how to use books to get information from it. It was a very interesting thing. Here's the deal. Jesus is just taking them through an open book test. They're in the middle of the water. 
They're rowing as hard as they can. They're not getting anywhere. They're freaking out. They're caving into despair and fear. And Jesus enters the boat and says, hey, boys, I have to tell you something. I'm a little disappointed, the Bible says, in your hardness of heart. I'm a little disappointed because you just experienced the feeding of the 15,000. And more, most probably in the boat is what? The scraps. The scraps. They're in the boat. Remnants of God's goodness to them just a little bit ago. Remnants that God has been good. Remnants that he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who always provides. Remnants are in the boat. They're paddling. The remnants are there, and they're freaking out. And God says, boys, I have to tell you I'm a little disappointed. I have to tell you I'm a little disappointed. Here's the deal. The problem, boys, is not that you don't have what it takes. The problem is you didn't recognize what I've given you to remind you that you do have what it takes. Boys, my problem with you today is you have a problem with your deductive reasoning. I am the same Jesus who fed the 15,000 people. The same Jesus. And now when your boat is rocking and reeling and you have remnants of my goodness and my power right there in the boat, you forget about the goodness of God. Boys, here's the deal. You're blessed to have the problems you have today because they're reminders of my goodness to you yesterday. Y'all with me this morning? That's what he wants us to do. Whenever I have problems in my life, I, I've had some good things happen to me in my life. I look back, I'm thankful for that, thankful for that. But when I have problems in my life, I go back to the times when I had nothing. You with me? Nothing. When I was in seminary, deeply in debt, and, 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 and my room that I lived in burned down, and the only thing I had was a clothes on my back. That was it. And I had to drop out and work. And through that work, God taught me his faithfulness. I remember I took my first church uh, $18,000 a year is what they paid me. And we had, they didn't give, I didn't have insurance. And so when I had two girls, we had to pay for their own birth. That's a lot of money. I didn't have it. I was deeply in debt, getting $18,000 a year. Remember, I went to a realtor in my church and said, hey, you know, you have all that property, all those homes and stuff in, for sale in the community. Who, in the summertime, who cuts that grass? And he says, oh, you have a high school student? I said, no, sir. No, sir. I, I, I have me. <laughs> I mean, he goes, you want to? Yeah. I remember Monday on my day off, I'd load my little car up with the lawnmower in the trunk, with the trunk open, a gas can full of gas, and I would just cut grass all day on my day off Monday so I'd have enough food so I could take care of my family. Vicki, you remember when we first moved to Loveland here, and, you know, we were good. We had good things, but we couldn't even afford two cars at the time. And Vicki, you remember taking the bus. You remember taking the bus to Fort Collins so I could take the car down to and, and then sometimes I wouldn't get back in time and she'd have to walk. <laughs> Remember those times you had to walk. Th th those are good things. Those are reminders. Those are those are reminders that God has been faithful to us. Does that make sense? Faithful to us. He continues to be faithful to us. And he's telling the disciples, hey boys, he, he, here I am. I'm here to make leaders of you. And I'm concerned in order for you to fulfill your destiny, to understand who you are. You have to look into your boat when it's filled with rot, when it's rocking and the water's coming in and the wind is blowing and it's dark. I want you to look into your boat today because in your boat are some scraps. Save the scraps of my goodness. Don't ever waste what God's goodness to you. Use them as lessons. Use them as reminders. Use them to deepen your faith. Use them to understand that the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever will never, ever leave you or forsake you. I'm the God of the mountaintop, and I'm the God in the valley. There's no need for you to despair when times are tough, because I got scraps in the boat, reminders that I will take you through. I'm Jehovah Jireh, the God who always provides. You got that this morning, church? We got to remember that today, because in a world where we have a lot, a lot of storms, a lot, a lot of storms, here's what God wants to remind us, is that he is with us. He is with us. If he wasn't with us, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be here today. He's with us to give us strength to keep rowing in the midst of tough times. And so today as a church, I want us to always remember God's goodness to us. In the midst of hard times, discouraging times, disappointing times, depressing times, God wants us to save the scraps of his faithfulness, to give us the resolve to keep on keeping on. So this morning we're going to do that. So I'm going to ask everybody to stand together.
Let's all stand together. Turn to your neighbor and say, save the scraps. They need to save the scraps. That's what it's all about, saving the scraps. While you're all standing, I'd like you all to bow your head, and I want you to close your eyes. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. And I want you, just in the privacy of this own moment, not to think of the people who you're sitting next to, standing next to, just right now, I want you to think about your own boat that you're in, your own personal boat. And in this private moment, I want you to take a little inventory in your boat. Take inventory. If we did, some of us would feel the wind blowing across our boat. There's some wind blowing today. For some of us, that wind is blowing hard and our boat is rocking. We feel it rocking. And we're rowing harder and harder. And we ain't getting anywhere. And it's tiring. And the wind is blowing. It's dark outside. And the waves are getting higher for some of us. And it's a little scary. There's darkness. There's danger. There's water coming in and the winds are blowing, and it's easy to cave in to fear. But in the privateness of this moment, I want you to also take a look in your boat. Take a hard look in your boat, because some of us have missed it. We've been too caught up in the rain and the wind and the waves. Take a look in your boat, and in the corner, you'll see a basket of scraps. Reminders that God has been good to you. If he wasn't good to you, you wouldn't be here today. If he wasn't faithful to you, you wouldn't be here. Some of us have got scars and scrapes. Some of us are beaten up. But through the midst of that, God has been good to you to us and he's brought you to this point not to abandon you but to show you that he's a God the Alpha and the Omega the God of the mountain and the God of the valley take a look at those scraps and remember the times when you thought you were alone and God was with you the time when you didn't think you would make it and you did the time when you thought you were alone and you weren't the time when you thought life was overwhelming and it wasn't the time when you were going to give up, but you didn't. Scraps. Those are God's scraps, reminders of his goodness in your life. Now, some of us, our boat is rocking really hard. It's scary. We don't know what the future looks like. So I want you not only to take a look at the scraps, but I want you to look a little bit beyond the waves and the wind and the danger. Because real close to your boat, you may not even know it. There's a presence there. It's not a ghost. It's not there to scare you. There's a presence there. It's Jesus Christ himself. And he's waiting. You know him. You've walked with him. But it's easy to leave him behind because of the busyness of life. It's easy to forget about him. But he's there. He knows everything you're going through. And he's waiting. He's waiting for the invitation to come into your boat. All you have to say, Jesus, I need you. Help me, Jesus. I need you now, Jesus. I'm hurting, Jesus. I'm tired, Jesus. I'm broken, Jesus. I don't have any hope, Jesus. I'm hurting, Jesus. My heart is busted, Jesus. Help me. I don't have the strength to keep rowing. All he needs to hear is the cry from you in the boat. And bam! He'll come into your boat. He'll come into your boat. He wants to remind us that he's the God when we're on the mountaintop and he's God when we're in the valley. And even though it may be lonely in the valley, he takes us through the valley to teach us his power, his presence, his love. How majestic, 
how powerful he really is. And when he teaches you, you know what we do? We save the scraps of that because he wants us to keep moving, to fulfill and to pursue our destiny. Save the scraps, people, the reminders of the power and the faithfulness, the goodness, the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ because he wants our boat to keep going to pursue our destiny. Father, thank you today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for life and health. It all comes from you. And I pray today that we'll always have scraps in our basket that will be reminders that we're never alone, that you're always with us. We're here today because of your goodness. We stand today as a church because of your faithfulness. We may be bruised, we may be battered, we may be at the point of despair, but we're not alone. You're right there. You're seeing everything we're going through. And we pray that, Father, that you would come into our boat. Calm the winds and the storms for those of us who feel overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. And for the rest of us, Father, may we always be mindful of the scraps. There are lessons for us to learn so that we could always have reminders that you're with us. Always have reminders of your faithfulness and your goodness. Father, thank you for the scraps we have they give us the power and the confidence to keep moving forward to be your people of destiny. Father, in our lives, have your way, and may your will be done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.